And so the way, what the females seem to be doing is using some marker or some set of markers as a proxy indicator for, for, for health. And I think, I think you could say with, with reasonable, you could say reasonable that, reasonably that female human beings do the same thing to male human beings. And there's some of that vice versa too, like we evaluate each other, for example, for symmetry, which is one of the elements of beauty, because healthier people tend to be more symmetrical, and lots of animals use symmetry. Butterflies, if butterflies won't mate with another butterfly, if it deviates from symmetry, by the tiniest amounts you can imagine. So symmetry is a marker, and there's other markers, like shoulder width to waist width is one, and waist width to hip width is another, that's usually what Males use that to evaluate females in part. So there's lots of markers of health. Um, but it also looks to me like the, the, the data worldwide seems to indicate that women, so imagine that women mate across dominance hierarchies and up, socioeconomically speaking. And on average, across cultures, women go for men who are about four to five years older. You know, it varies. In the Scandinavian countries, that's shrunk a little bit, but not that much and in other cultures it's bigger. I would say that depends to some degree on difficulty of establishing economic independence, right? Because in richer countries it's easier to have enough economic independence if you're a male to be, to be a useful participant in the process of having children. Um, but it doesn't matter, cross-culturally it's still across and up where men mate across and down. They don't care much about socioeconomic status. It doesn't seem to be part of their selection method, um, generally speaking. So, so, I think that part of that is also that the ability of women to select for, for male health, it's something like that, because it isn't that only that, because if you're healthy and energetic, you're much more likely to be successful, because it's very hard to be successful if you're ill, obviously, I mean, so, because the competition is just too high. And both, both genders, both sexes select each other for attractiveness, both select for intelligence, both select for personality, although the, the, the different, there are differences there in terms of what's, what's stressed. But, so, so, so I think you can derive a couple of things out of, out of this, and this is where I think people are different than, than other animals, importantly different, is that, so you imagine that there's tremendous selection pressure to uh, towards the production, let's say, of men who are good at climbing male dominance hierarchies or, or climbing the male dominance hierarchy. But the thing that's so interesting about people is that we've multiplied our dominance hierarchies. You know, if, if you take an animal that's got a rather static behavioral pattern, then there's, there's a single hierarchy. Elephant seals are a good example of that. So elephant seals, the males, are absolutely massive. They're way, way bigger than the females. And they basically have harems, roughly speaking. And they, they use physical prowess as their marker of status, essentially, and obviously size is a huge part of that because otherwise the male elephant seals wouldn't be as, they're massive, these things, they're absolutely enormous. And so it's just power, slash health, you know, maybe aggression, something like that. It's whatever makes them more um, suitable for the kind of physical combat that elephant seals engage in. So, and the degree to which power is associated with dominance status in those sorts of situations seems to be associated with the size differential between males and females. So the more power is an issue with regards to male competence, the larger the males are compared to the females, and the more likely the males are going to have a harem relationship with the females. And you see that a little bit in human beings, because men are bigger than women. They're not overwhelmingly bigger, that's sexual dimorphism. And you know, there's some men that are smaller than some women, but on average men are taller and they're, they have more upper body strength and so forth. So there is a power element to male competition, but it's not as extended as it would be among animals, say like, like elephant seals. So in the elephant seal, you see maybe there's one stable set of traits that's being selected for that makes the males more likely to reproduce. But human beings, we're very weird creatures because we're so conceptually flexible, and so what seems to have happened, maybe we started, males started selecting each other for do, in dominance competitions for something like cognitive flexibility and, and conscientiousness, it's something like that. So that would be the ability to abstractly represent the world and then the ability to operate effectively within it, to represent yourself socially in a way, and then to carry through with that, because that enables people to trust you. So it's something like that. and so. That produced cortical expansion, and then women were selecting men who were good at that, and that produced cortical expansion, and then 
there's an arms race between women and men with regards to intelligence, so the women kept up, or they certainly kept up with, with, with intelligence as, as the evolutionary cycle continued. <laughs>